start off this morning by singing Blessed Be Your Name. You can hit your feet. Shine. 
that you have given us. We thank you for the many things that are going on in life. Dear Lord, we ask you to be with us today. We ask you to touch those that are in need. We ask you to be with our sick people. We ask you to heal their bodies that only you can do through them. your name. And everything that we do today, that we open our hearts, we open our minds to worship, fellowship. We put everything out of our minds right now except for why we're here today. Dear Lord, we ask you to bless us through this service. Keep us all safe, for it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. As we uh, get ready to uh, go into our communion time, um, we, we often have times that um, we have opportunities to, uh, to witness and to do things around people that may not know Christ. But um, all the things that we do as Christians, we, we do it by what? You know, God has taught us through His Word. And uh, this morning, we're going to introduce this new song to you. And if you know it, sing along with it. If you don't, if you don't just close your eyes and listen to the words. Because everything we do is not in me, but it's through Christ in me. So that's what this song is going to talk about this morning. What a gift of
the 12th chapter of Hebrews, verse 2, ought to be a familiar verse for many. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. As we prepare to partake of the emblems that have been prepared, we do so by fixing our eyes on Jesus, recalling the price of our salvation, his death on the cross. We appreciate how he endured the cross, the pain and agony of being nailed and hung up to die under the heat of the sun. At any moment, he could have made those who had taught him eat their words by saving himself and coming down from the cross. Yet he remained. He stayed upon the cross until he breathed his last. He endured the crucifixion for he had to taste the misery of death in order to provide the way of life for us. It is his endurance on the cross that we appreciate. We are amazed how he went there to die with joy. For the joy set before him endured the cross. He did not look at the cross with resentment for having to die for you and me. He did not view his crucifixion with apathy just to fulfill what needed to be done and getting it over with. He did not consider the execution to be unfair because although he was sinless, he was accused of wrongs and that he had not done, sentenced to death, but he was sentenced because of the wickedness of others. Instead, Jesus had joy, for he knew that his death would provide the opportunity for anyone to be forgiven of their sins and grant them access to the throne room where he has gone on before us and sitting at the right hand of God. It is a joy to redeem us in his crucifixion that amazes us. We're astonished with the truth that concerning the cross, Jesus despised the shame. We look at the cross with, and view it with reverence and honor. For we see our salvation upon that old rugged cross. We have dismiss the shame of the cross because it means so much to us. Yet the Romans used such punishment to shame the criminals, to warn others not to commit like crimes. To the Jews it was terrible, because under the law, that person was cursed, because anyone who's hung on a tree is cursed of God. The Apostle Paul shared in Corinthians how the crucifixion of Christ was a stumbling block to the Jews, while the Gentiles viewed it as foolishness. Despite the shame that the cross would bring, Jesus disregarded the shame, did not consider it something to be shameful about, for he knew that it would resolve the shame that we have due to our sins before God. He dismissed the shame he would face, so that the shame that we would have because of our waywardness would be gone away, and that astounds us. While this is a time that we fix our eyes upon Jesus, the reason why he was able to endure the cross with joy, despising the shame, is because he had his eyes fixed on us. Jesus' cross grants us life eternal by providing the means for us to be forgiven of our sins so that we can stand before God no longer ashamed, but welcome as his child. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to... To, to pause and reflect upon that salvation, the great price that was paid for my sins, for our sins, even for the sins of the world. How he shed his blood so that we can be forgiven. And Lord, as we partake of these emblems, may we just recall once more how he fixed his eyes on us as we look at the bread representing his body and the fruit of the vine representing his blood. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. He blessed it, and he gave it to them and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. He blessed it and gave it to them and said, Drink ye all of it, for this cup is the blood of the covenant which is shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you. 
this time our K through fifth grade can be dismissed back to June Church. Well, thank our drama and our flag team of this morning for that presentation. What a powerful name it is, amen? What a wonderful time to get together this morning to worship and praise the Lord. Um, for those who might be visiting with us, we've been in a series uh, talking about the basics of Christianity and the church. In Acts chapter 2, uh, we just called it Church Basics. Uh, we've talked about uh, fellowship, we've talked about the Word, we've talked about communion, we've talked about prayer. And uh, this week we're going to talk about uh, the name, uh, our name, the church name. You know, why do we have, why is our, out front, our, our church called Philippi Church of Christ? Uh, why do we call ourselves Christians? Why are we governed by uh, uh, eldership uh, in our church? These are questions that we're going to discuss today as we talk about the invincible name of Christ. First, let's talk about how Jesus Christ is the head of the church. You know, Christ came to establish uh, one church. Uh, there's many churches with many different names. You don't have to travel far uh, to see those names on churches all around. But Jesus came to establish one church. Paul calls the church the body. In fact, he calls it one body. We look at Ephesians 4 and verse 4, he says, there is one body. There's one spirit. In Romans 12, he says, so in Christ, those who are many form how many bodies? Just checking with you. How many? One body. That's right. So one of the reasons that I'm a member of the, the church of Christ, the Christian church's restoration movement, is because I believe that Jesus Christ founded it. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, 18, he says, upon this rock, I will build my church, Jesus church. And because he bought it with his precious blood, he shed his blood for his church. And that being true, it's wrong for other people to be members of churches that have been, if you will, founded by someone else that is not Jesus church. That would be a competition to, to the son of God, which was established his church by his blood today. Now, of course, some may say, well, that's kind of extremism. You're, you're going beyond uh, what we should talk about here. But we're just trying to do things in Bible ways and call things by Bible names as part of the church. Christ is the one head of his church, one church. And I'm a member of that church. And those of you that are, are part of the church, which is Christ's body, believe today that he is the head of the church. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. For as the husband is the head of the wife, even so Christ is the, what's he say? He is the head of the church. And he's the savior of that body. That means that we have Jesus Christ, the son of God. All these different names that you saw out here displayed before you. Jesus Christ, he's the head of the church. Every congregation that we have is free. It's independent with no ecclesiastical ties to any other various congregations, if you will, or any headquarters. But we have our local government and the church under his headship, under Christ's leadership. Now, that does not constitute what we would call a denominational body. And it would be wrong for us to be a, a person or a member of a church that has a human being really as the head. Because, again, who's the head of the church? Christ is the head of the church. And that's not hatred for mankind. That's simply recognizing who is the head. We teach and practice that the church is under the headship of Jesus Christ. Um, there, with no earthly headquarters, this headquarters is where? It's in heaven. Yes, he's come to establish the church. But look at Ephesians 1, what he says there. God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Colossians 1.18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. So I believe that the church that Jesus Christ founded on the day of Pentecost is constituting all Christians everywhere, and Jesus is the head of that church. So we need to lay that out as the foundation uh, that we're going to build upon today and talk about. Jesus is the head of the church. So now let's look at the name of the church. As we talk about that, we could go a long ways in different directions. Let's first talk about corporately. The churches of Christ, Christian churches, which we're a part of, wear Christ's name. We can't honor Christ, we believe, and wear another name. Just as a wife doesn't honor a husband 
and take somebody else's name. Um, and we cannot honor the church which is called the bride of Christ. Does not honor Christ unless we wear his name. And only in the name of Christ is there salvation. Jesus himself said, I am the only way. I am the way, the truth, the life. So it makes perfect sense for us to look at scripture and say, yeah, he's the head of the church. So whose church is it? Who died for the church? Jesus Christ did that. She so might ask, by what authority do we teach and wear the name of Church of Christ? Look at Romans 16, 16. Is it scripturally accepted? Well, we see there, greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send their greeting. So we see that actually churches of Christ is a, a scriptural name for the church. Jesus says he's going to again build his church. We believe that the church of Christ, Christian churches are that church that has been built because we're built upon the foundation that is here. Of course, we recognize that there are other names in scripture that the churches are called. Just look at a few. The church of God. God's church, church of the living God, church of the firstborn. You see the scriptures there uh, on the screen, the church. Then there was a very general, the church that identified by a geographical area. We found the church that met in Judea, the church at Antioch, the church at Sincrea, the church at Galatia, the, the Thessalonian churches, the Macedonian churches, the seven different churches in Revelation. Then there's also general titles. Kingdom of God, kingdom of Christ, kingdom of heaven, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. So we feel like that any term that signifies that the church belongs to Christ, to God, seems to be acceptable in Scripture. However, these refer to, again, one church or body established by who? By Christ. Under whose headship? Christ's headship. So we also realize that simply because someone calls themselves by a scripturally authorized name doesn't make them necessarily the Lord's church. For example, I remember telling somebody one time, they asked what church I came from. They weren't familiar with the, the restoration movement, Churches of Christ. However, they were, were familiar with a Church of Christ up in the northeast a part of our country, which is actually a cult. They actually call themselves the Church of Christ, but they believe nothing like we do. So there are other people and other churches that have similar names but are not scripturally founded in the Bible. Now, what we should do, I believe, is call Bible things by Bible names, and that's what we've done. So we ask the question, by what authority do we call the church by which we attend any other name? How do we do that? How do we call it a another name? We find here in Scripture, by authority of Christ, that we see it's His church that is founded. So that covers the body as a whole. But what about us individually? What should we be called? Uh, we aim, again, to be Christians only. Uh, we find ourselves as a non-denominational, a, a free church. We've chosen not to affiliate ourselves with any denomination or where any other denominational names that might divide us from other followers. We claim not to be the only Christians, but to be Christians only. Again, let's say that. We claim not to be the only Christians, but what? Christians only. So we wear the name of Christian because it's the name that honors, again, who established the church, who is the head of the church, which is Christ. So our plea is for us to all just be Christians. Let's not wear another name. Um, and together we follow him under the New Testament that is there. Look in Acts chapter eleven twenty six. It says the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So we see that it is a scriptural name. That they were called Christians first at Antioch. 1 Peter 4, 16. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear his name. So we wear the, head, the name of the head of the church. We don't wear somebody else's name. We don't wear a name pattern after a system, pattern after an act, pattern after a man-made name. We're just called Christians or disciples of Christ. Uh, which means that we're a follower of Christ. In fact, some people today have kind of flipped it around, and I've noticed a lot of people will say, well, are you a Christ follower? That's what a Christian is, isn't it? A Christ follower. And that's fine to be called that. I, I, I'm, I'm a Christ follower. I'm a, I'm a disciple of Christ in that way. 
So they were called after the name of Christ. And that's a name that you can't utter without naming Christ as the head. That's why I really like that. I think it's ingenious for, for God to do that. We, we honor Christ with what we are called as Christians in that way. Now, that's not an opinion. It's the Bible there. That's where the name came from. It's from the scriptures. I've got no problem with someone having an objection to uh, somebody's personal opinion. But when it's a, a, not an opinion and we find it in scripture, then it's a matter of faith that we look here and say, well, you know, is that an issue today? That would be called something different. Yeah, it is. It was an issue back in Bible times. Yes, it was. Let's go to a scripture that kind of points this out in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. There was a time in the early church when members adopted the names of other men in order to kind of separate themselves. Uh, and we see Paul dealt with that. Look what he says in 1 Corinthians 1. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look, he starts right off by naming. This, this is who we're talking about. That all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers, some from close household have informed me that there's quarrels among you. Now, what I mean is this. One of you says, well, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. To Peter. Still another says, I follow Christ. He says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now, that was the result of division in the church. It promoted people above the foundation. Again, is who? Who's the foundation of the church? Christ. He's the head of the church. Not Peter. Not Paul. Not Cephas. He's saying right away, you shouldn't be identified with them. You know, yes, they may be your preacher. They may be the leader in that area. But Christ is the one that you're founded upon. Now, as they were forming these own little denominations, even back then, Paul was telling them this isn't the way it should be. And so wearing human names gives preeminence to a person or to an act. And human names conceal the fact that Jesus is the founder of the church. So I wear the name Christian. I, I need to be identified as Christian even more than I am a Protestant. You notice sometimes we're called Protestants or we're called uh, evangelicals or we're called independents. Maybe some of those things are true. Are we evangel evangelistic? I hope we are. Are we Protestant as opposed to being part of the greater Catholic church? Yes, we are. We follow some roots back to, to Martin Luther. Um, yes, we protested some of the things in the Catholic church. But there was a coming out. But are we, first of all, Christians? Yes. That's what we need to be identified. They were first called Christians in Antioch. And so that's a scriptural name. You know, it's broad enough to include Christians who had been Jews, Gentiles, those who have been slaves, those who were free, those that were nomads, you know, and on and on we could go. Yet it was not narrow enough, or it was narrow enough to exclude idol worshipers. It identified you as following Christ, not some idol, not some other religion. As we can say, well, are you a, do you follow Buddha? Are you a Buddhist? Are you a Hindu? Do you follow in that, in that path? And we could go on with that. So name a Christian, beautifully appropriate. They were called Christians. And many times they would say, well, I'm a Christian slave. Or I'm a Christian carpenter. Or I'm a Christian storekeeper. Uh, what a way to identify yourself as someone that follows Christ. This gave Jesus preeminence, Colossians 1.18. It recognizes the importance of the name of Jesus that we sang about earlier. That he's the only name that we're saved by. That he is the one that went to the cross for me. He's the one I recognize. He's the one I worship. I'm a Christ follower. I'm a Christian. And on this subject, uh, Russell Boatman wrote a, a book. And he, in that book, he was entitled, uh, What the Bible Says About the Church. He asked a series of questions. It kind of really gets you thinking. He says, what if the angel who announced Jesus' birth to Joseph said, well, call his name, eh, whatever you think of. What if what's his name had commissioned his apostles to go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Tom, Dick, and Harry? What if Peter on the Pentecost had said, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Elon Musk? What if Peter, Peter had said to the crippled man at Temple Gate, in the name of common sense, won't you get up and walk? Silly, I know. 
Names are important. We should wear the name that glorifies our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we should do. Not the only Christians, but Christians only. Now let's talk about, that was a plea of the restoration movement from the beginning. Uh, where we come from, our roots back in the 1800s. Uh, where we find that we try to get back to the Bible and do Bible things in Bible ways and call Bible things by Bible names. Just a reminder for many folks that may not be familiar with that plea that it goes back to Scripture. That's why we do, and that's why we have the name uh, Church of Christ. But there's something else that sometimes is puzzling as well uh, to us. is about the organization of the church. We've said that Christ is the foundation, is the head of the church, but we try, try to follow a New, pa New Testament pattern for how we're governed as well. Now, in some instances, the Christ church is spoken of in a universal sense. We think about the church collectively. Wherever it exists out in the world, we just say the church. And that's that's when we cover that, we say, well, that's the church is meeting in India today or in Africa or those are, are meeting in China or wherever it might be. We say the church at large. But then there's a local church in the local area, whereas we would say, oh, that's Philippi Church of Christ or that's Zion's Chapel Church of Christ in Roper. That's Plymouth Church of Christ here. We identify local churches in that way. And there's the pattern that's set forth in the New Testament. Each congregation was a free, self-governing body of believers. Um, there were no presbyteries. There was no synods. We read of no dioceses, no archdioceses, no governing conferences, no assemblies. You can't go to Scripture and show that. You can't find that. But you see a, a plurality of elders that are there. The New Testament congregations had a very simple structure uh, in the Bible. There were three permanent roles for the church in the Bible. Now we see the apostles and the prophets, they were temporary roles. The establishment of the church, they were given and, and that office is gone. But we find evangelists, which are called preachers in the Bible, missionaries. You got Timothy, Titus, who preached the gospel. They edified the brethren in that way. Then there were elders which are also called in the Bible presbyters. They're called shepherds, overseers, uh, pastors. They were responsible for leading, for administrating, for teaching, for shepherding, for disciplining, uh, for spiritual oversight of the congregation. And then there were deacons, which were ministry servants, if you will, responsible for carrying out specific ministries like taking care of the widows that we find in Scripture. We don't find priests, archbishops, Cardinals, popes, patriarchs, nuns, monks, friars, church presidents, district superintendents, television pastors. We don't find any of those that are in Scripture. Now, beyond the local congregation, no further organization for Christ's church was found. No earthly headquarters controlling all the churches. Each local congregation independent, subject to who is the head? Christ. Though God did give leaders for the local church under that headship of Christ and that privilege for that headship. But you know who was supposed to be carrying out the ministry of the church? If any of you got a mirror, just hold a mirror up in front of you. That's right. Each one of us are supposed to do that. Look at Ephesians 4. He gave some to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for the works of service. So the body of Christ could be built up. 1 Peter 2, 9. You're a chosen people. He calls each one of us a royal priesthood. Why don't you say it with me? I'm a priest. I am a priest. Did you know that? Did you look in the mirror this morning and think, I'm a priest? But you are. Each one of us are. We're a holy nation. A people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him. He says, who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Now, we don't make special distinctions between clergy and laity. That's why none of our preachers, you won't hear me referring to myself as somebody a reverend. That's reserved for God alone. And I know some folks will tease sometimes and say, call me, quote, reverend. And I kind of, you know, slightly kind of rebuke them. The only God is really is reverend in Scripture. Some of our ministers are leaders. Some of our ministers dedicate themselves uh, to ministry vocationally. Others are bivocational in that way. But every member... Is called to a ministry. Do you believe that? Every one of us are called to ministry. I love what General Eisenhower uh, did. Once he rebuked one of his generals for referring to a soldier as just a private. He called him just a private. Here's what he said. He reminded him that the army could not function better 
that the army could function better without its generals than it could without its foot soldiers. And isn't that true? He said, if the war is going to be won, it's going to be won by the privates. In the same way, the common, ordinary, every one of us, Christian, not the great evangelist, not the great missionaries, not the, the greats that you might put on and you know some names, but each one of us are do the work of God, as he said there in Ephesians, to prepare God's people for the works of service. As we talked about the other week about the harvest prayer, that we need to be praying that the Lord of the harvest would send out workers into his harvest field. That should be our prayer, that each of us would go to our neighbors, to our friends, to the workplace, in our school, that we be the people we need to be. Now, the way the church was organized is a pattern that we want to emulate. They were all ministers, but the organization had to have a local leadership. And we find in the Bible that there was a plurality of elders. Now, this is different than many churches today. There's so many types of governing uh, systems with different offshoots. But here's some of the most popular, okay? Now, just, this is to tell you what's going on. There's congregational. That's where the congregation actually rules and votes basically on everything. The Baptist, which is often really pastor-led. Um, oftentimes, um, I get referred to many times as a pastor, but oftentimes in a, a Baptist situation, the pastor's really the head, and, and in some churches even, quote, even owns a building or owns the property that's there. There's Episcopalian, which has a hierarchy and has a, a bishop that would be over an area. There's a Catholic which has a hierarchy and who's at the top of the Catholic church. The Pope that is there. Then there's Presbyterian, which is a presbytery run a system as well. I believe the Bible teaches that elders are to exercise authority over the local church. Here's the scriptural evidence that we will give for that. Now notice that the leaders that Paul sent for when he came to each town. Look in Acts 20, 17 and 28. From the leaders, Paul sent to Ephesus for the, the elders of the church. Verse 28, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Again, another word for elder. Be shepherds. Again, another word for elder of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. So he's telling you, hey, the church is Jesus. It belongs to him. But you be a shepherd over. You be a pastor over that, that flock. You look after the spiritual oversight. Notice the, the leadership Paul addresses when he writes to each church. Just one example, Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus of Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons. The two roles that we talked about earlier. Now we could talk about all the qualifications for elders and deacons that are given in 1 uh, Timothy 3. That's going to be for another sermon. Uh, the, the qualifications <coughs> listed there. But here we see that elders are chosen for God's work. Look at Titus chapter 1, verse 5. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished. And look what he says. To appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And then he starts saying the elder must be blameless and must be the husband of one wife. And, and on and on we can go. Look at verse 7. Since an overseer is entrusted with God's work. So the overseer, the elder, the shepherd, the pastor is to do that. And notice that in Titus and here in Acts, there was a plurality. Never did you, you see the elder. It was elders, a plural, not just one. Look at Acts 14, 23. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church with prayer and fasting, committing them to the Lord in whom he had put their trust. In the beginning, we see elders making decisions for the church. Look at Acts 16.4. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people that day. The elders were also not only administrators and pastoral looking after the flock, oftentimes they did the preaching too. So we can see that many of our churches, we have preaching elders. The elders who direct the affairs of the church in 1 Timothy 5.17, well, are they worthy of double honor. Especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. Today it's interesting that uh, we had Ian Fry here the other week. And they're talking about establishing all these churches, all these house churches. Well, they don't have preachers going to all these house churches. They have leaders in each of those churches. Elders that are doing the preaching and doing the teaching um, over each house church that is there. A scriptural conception. 
You know, I think there's uh, many misconceptions that has arose through the years, even in our ranks in the Church of Christ. Um, and perhaps we, some aren't as harmful as others, but I think they need to be named. And let's look at some of those as we kind of wind this, uh, or wind this section up here today. One is elders which pass the buck. Allowing thorny problems to fester and kind of hide their heads in the sand and uh, as an ostrich and pretend that the real problems aren't there. Um, the elders' motto should be the buck stops here. Um, you know, make the tough decisions. You read Acts 15 and 16. They had to make some tough decisions uh, in the early church. Elders, number two, are over the spiritual, deacons over the physical. Really, the elders are over all the work of the church. Uh, you know, we don't see that in Scripture, that they're just over the spiritual. And they're over the church all the time. Now, this is not to say they do all the work, but they delegate. And this is in harmony with Scripture. They delegate. We see ministers. We see people in the church that are, are deacons. And those are ministry leaders and teachers doing their work. But the elders are over everything. They delegate and organize. Third misconception is deacons are junior elders. A you know, man is either an elder or is not in the church. Uh, he's not a halfway elder or part-time elder or he's working to be an elder. Uh, we see a different role completely from an elder and a deacon. If you look in Scripture and see what they are supposed to do, uh, the position of elder, there are two different responsibilities. One's a servant leader and the other is an overseer, a pastor of the church. A fourth misconception is women as elders. You know, till, till a woman can be a husband of one wife, which that's what Scripture says, um, then that position is going to be masculine. And everywhere it's mentioned is a masculine pronoun in Scripture. It's he or him. So we believe they cannot. And that's another sermon for another day on the different roles that women and men have in the church. Then there's church board decisions. You know, nowhere in Scripture do we find where deacons could outvote elders in a meeting. And so... Whose will would be running the church? Who would have oversight of the church? It would in reality be the deacons if they outvoted elders. And so in some churches, we see that is a real problem that is happening. Uh, today in our church, that's not what happens. Our deacons meet with our elders. Our elders then make decisions based on sometimes it's deacons uh, recommendations that take place. And then they would vote on whether that happens or not. The sixth is elders that are really devoid of any authority. Nowhere in Scripture we find congregational votes where elders would be selected to popularity. We find them selected according to, the, to what the guidelines were there. Now today, the way we, we do that, and our, our elders are set aside by those that are qualified in Scripture, by the Word of God as our guide. Now, I know because we have two services, we don't have our elders and our deacons at every service. But I do know, let's see, I, I saw, I see, see Wayne back. Where, Wayne, where are you at? Would you stand? Wayne, right here. Lee, where are you at? Are you, right, don't you stand back here? Here's two of our elders. Uh, Mitchell is not with us in this service. He'll be in the second service. But here are two of our elders here today, two of the three. And uh, if you guys appreciate them, give them a hand. Our deacons, uh, Buddy and Charlie, are uh, no buddies here back in the back. Is Charlie off today? Where are you at, Charlie? Stand up here, Charlie. I know you don't want to be recognized. Stand up. <laughs> Let's give those guys a hand. Our congregation, we, we want it to be biblical. Do you want, to, do you want to, to be a part of a biblical church today? Amen? I do too. Uh, are, are we a perfect church? No, because we're imperfect people. Um, and I know that maybe gets misused, but it's true. Uh, we all make mistakes, and we all, all are not what we need to be. Um, and they say maybe we live in a glass house because we serve as, as elders, ministers, uh, deacons, you, you Sunday school teachers as well. We know the judgment's going to be more strict because of, of that role as well. But we want to tell you that we love you, and we try to do what is best. Um, and we want to make sure that Christ is glorified. Amen? We need, there's no other name. What a powerful demonstration that was earlier uh, with our, our praise, our, our worship through drama, and our, um, also our flag team. Uh, there's something I want to leave you with uh, today as we kind of close up and our praise team comes and leads us. There's a couple of scriptures because we have a, a role as well. The Bible says that we should respect our leadership. We look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 
Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. So there needs to be a, a respect uh, for leadership that is here and hold them in highest regard. Look at Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders. Submit to their authority. Keep, uh, they keep watch over you as men who must give an account. And, and they realize that. Obey them so that their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that will be of no advantage to you. Um, I think for the most part, I think I can speak for the guys that are, are, are elders and our deacons, that you do make it a joy uh, to serve. Are there occasions? Yes. <laughs> but it is a joy to serve. And the Bible says that we are to give respect and honor to those that, that lead the congregation. I know also I implore you to pray uh, for them. Uh, for decisions that we have to make, tough decisions that are made uh, in leadership. It's oftentimes not easy decisions uh, to be made. Uh, so pray for them as well in that. But today, I hope that we can, as we leave this place, we can say, you know, now I know why we've got Church of Christ on our name. Now I know why I should just be called Christian today. Now I know why we have elders in our church and deacons in our church, and, and you have a better understanding how, so you can explain it to somebody else is that's how the church uh, was run in the first century and how we've tried to emulate the church that he established according to Scripture. You know, next week we're going to talk about salvation, how the Bible says we are to be saved. Um, and well, I know that is a, for many people, uh, that's an easy one. For other people, it's not so easy. Uh, but the Bible tells us uh, we're to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that gave his life on the cross for us. The Bible tells us it's only by grace that we're saved. It's only through God's loving us enough to give of His Son, to believe, us to believe in that. And then we repent of our sins that, that nailed Him to the cross. We confess Him a daily as our Lord and Savior. He's the only one that we serve. He's the only way to heaven. That we're baptized into Christian baptism. A beautiful picture of the death, burial, resurrection, resurrection of Christ. And then we live for Him daily. Maybe there's somebody here today that, and I know that was a sim simplification of what we need to do. There's somebody here who's been thinking about that needs to do that. You know, there's, you can respond to the invitation at any time. Amen? You don't have to wait till the end of the church service to do that. We've gotten the habit of doing that in our churches. Uh, maybe that's the time you even thought about coming today. If so, if you've got a decision to make or just prayer need, whatever you want to do today, maybe place membership. Why don't you come? We're going to stand together and sing. I close you.
be seated for a moment, please. I'd like to ask our, our moms and dads and children to come up for our baby dedication at this time. Uh, those that are going to be dedicating their children, if you would come on up here and we've got to ask some here. And this is moms and dads and grandparents as well. So if you grandparents want to come up here. I mean, you can have cousins and whatever you want. <laughs> we got three families today that are going to come forward and have their children dedicated. We've not done a dedication since COVID, uh, so um, there are quite a few, and I know there are others that will be coming forthcoming. We'll probably do another one in the fall as well. The three families that come today come to dedicate uh, Macy and Benji and Connor to the Lord, and they would like your encouragement and your prayers to to help these little ones um, and to grow up in a way that, that's pleasing to God. Now, those of us that have been around Jonathan and Chelsea and uh, Benj and Jackie and Carl and Kate uh, know that uh, they love their kids. And we love their kids, right? Yes. Uh, we really do. And because of that great love, we want uh, them to have a life that is the best life ever. And we know the best life is a life that is served uh, for Christ and people that grow up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So as Christians today, um, we want to stand behind them as they want to publicly dedicate uh, their children to the Lord, Macy and Benji and Connor. Now, this is best expressed in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, to bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. In the Old Testament, we have one occasion when uh, someone was dedicated to the Lord. We have found in, uh, Hannah, and whose boy's name was Samuel, and uh, they were brought to the temple by Hannah to dedicate Samuel uh, to the Lord. 1 Samuel 1, 26-28. As surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I pray for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked for him. So now I give him to the Lord. For the whole life he will be given over to the Lord. So today, Jonathan and Chelsea, again, Benjamin, and Jackie, and Carl and Kate, uh, come today to dedicate Macy and Benji and Connor to the Lord. Now, Macy and Benji and Connor aren't going to be turned over to the church for me and Nadine to raise, or the elders here to raise uh, today. They ain't giving the babies up, I know that, uh, like uh, Hannah did with Samuel. But we're told in 1 Peter 2, 5 that we as Christians, all of us, as living stones, are to be built up into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices that are pleasing to God. So this building, it's not, this is not the church. Who's the church? Yeah. That's right, we are. So in a way, they're dedicating their children to the Lord, and we are the ones that they're turning their children over to, to help with their spiritual training. I'm looking at it, Sunday school teachers, and those that are teaching a junior church, and those that are, are in the toddlers, uh, where these uh, will be. And, These come to give their children over to the Lord today, and uh, I know today it's our hope uh, that we help uh, raise them up uh, to know the Lord, to grow up in the Lord, and these families want that, uh, for us to be there for them in that way. So I look at Scripture, and I find uh, 1 Samuel 2, 20, 2, 21 and 26. Hey, little Benji. Um, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord, and the boy Samuel continued to grow and nurture our statue in favor with the Lord and men. Now, that's what I know these families want. They want to see their children are raised up in that way. And so today we come to do that, to help them dedicate their children. Uh, we're going to find some slides on the screen. There'll be one for each family and then one for us as a congregation. Okay, for us to, to help them today. So let's first throw the first slide up there. Now this is uh, for the Phelps family, okay, for you guys to read together and I'll get you started. You ready? We pledge today before God and our fellow believers to bring Daisy Phelps up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Okay, now for all of us as a congregation, the next one. You ready? We pledge today before God and our fellow believers to pray, support, Encourage and help Jonathan and Chelsea and family as they bring the up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Okay, the next one I think is for Mrs. Yeah. Love. Yeah. Okay, I thought that's okay. You guys ready? We pledge today 
before God and our fellow believers to bring Connor Clifton up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Okay? Now for our congregation, we pledge today before God and our fellow believers to pray, support, and encourage and help Carl and Kate and family as they bring Connor up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Okay? And last but not least is there's a little wild guy right here. <laughs> okay, you guys ready? We pledge today before God and our fellow believers to bring Ben Nichols up in the training and instruction of the Lord. All right. And then congregation. We pledge today before God and our fellow believers to pray, support, encourage, and help Benji and Jackie and family as they bring Benji up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Amen. Let's have a prayer for uh, these children now and their families, okay? Dear God, we're thankful for children. We know that your word, that they're a blessing uh, truly from you. And we thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have as parents and grandparents and extended family to be a part of their lives and to help them grow. Lord, today, as we look out, we see their potential and what they can be and what you see them. You know what they can be in the future. We pray that you'd help us to be the congregation, to be the families that we need to be for these young people. Lord, we look around at the world today and we see what sin has done to it. And Lord, we want to send them out as a light in this darkness to make a difference in the world. We're thankful, Lord, that we as Christians can be that light. Help them, protect them uh, from the evil one and from temptations. Help their, their parents as they go through struggles and trials as, as children grow up. Give them the perseverance they need. Give them the dedication to you to not forsake you, to continue to be faithful to you and your church. Help us, Lord, as the church to be behind them, to, to help them as we pray for them, as we encourage them, as we help teach. Help us to be the family of God we need to be for each one of them. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're so thankful for your families able to be uh, with them today, extended family as well. And thank you to the kids who did a really good job. Give them a hand. Give them a hand. Okay. Just a, a few uh, closing comments, uh, announcements. Why y'all? You guys can stay right here. It's fine. Uh, this coming Saturday night, the Ball Bros, which we've been announcing for a long time, will be with us at six o'clock. Uh, the way we're going to do uh, snacks is things, uh, it's going to be free, but they're going to be before the concert, okay? So it starts at 6, just say it, okay? It starts at 6. So concessions will be open quite a bit before that. If you want to come get your you know, drink, chips, or stuff like that, uh, or cookie, then there'll be a break time during the concert, okay? So uh, please be kind to our guests. We're looking for a lot of guests to come in, um, but, you know, Let's make room. We'll try to get as many chairs set up as possible. Uh, but we're, we're looking for a full house. So just a, a word to the wise, come early, okay, for a concert. And pass the word this week, okay? Um, also, remember, I think uh, Benji's laser tag sign up. And, yeah, okay. Um, and a couple other things are coming up. Any other things before we close today? Uh, just, uh, I know, a, good. Thank you. Yes. Uh, we didn't get it in the newsletter. We did have it in the bulletin, but the fire department uh, dinner is today in Columbia. That's 11 until uh, lunch. Okay. And I know Miss Brenda would love for us to, to keep her in prayers as Miss Brenda's hand is really messed up. And Wayne's here this morning, but she's at home. So let's remember them in our, our prayers as she's had to have surgery, Brenda Snell. And we appreciate kind of as well. Many of you don't know, but Nadine's mom is in the hospital in Washington. Um, and has been there since Friday night. We spent all night there Friday night. So be in prayer for her as well. Not really concerned to know whether it was a slight stroke or whether it was something else. But they're doing tests on the MRI tomorrow. So remember Nadine's mom in your prayers, Lucy Lowell, too. Okay? Any others as we close this morning? Yeah, if I got a big smile on my face today, y'all know why. In about 36 hours, we get to see our kids and grandkids. Yes. Yay, Bunny Sue, yes. All right. Pray for safety as they travel tomorrow. Their COVID test was negative, so they can travel. That's really good. So. All right. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for a good day being together uh, with brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, help us that daily we can encourage others to be your followers. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.